Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, dogs, cats, bats, rats, mutants, aliens, and the undead, welcome to episode two of the beta podcast, Hate Live, streaming live from wet, disgusting, humid Connecticut, Thursday night, June 6, 2013. And here's your host, DSP. Let's give a good round of applause for our announcer. I pay him a lot of money to do that, so, you know, give him a little golf clap. All right, welcome, everyone, to Hate Live. This is episode two of my newly ongoing podcast, and if you're not aware of how this works, uh, I'm going to be doing this Thursday nights, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Twitch TV, and then subsequently recording it and uploading it to the King of Hate Vlogs on YouTube overnight that night, because it is a longer show. It takes quite a while to upload, uh, and I'm going to be doing this three times a month if I can. If I'm busy, if I'm traveling, or something's going on on a Thursday, then we're going to have a bye week, but I'm going to try my best to do it consistently on Thursdays, except for the weeks when I do Ask the King, which was last week, because that was just such a long you know, podcast-style show of me answering questions and stuff. There's no reason for me to do up a uh, hate live that week, okay? So, we got a lot to talk about this week. It's been two weeks since we did an episode. Lots of stuff has happened, uh, whether it's stuff that I'm involved in, whether it's gaming news, whether it's all kinds of different stuff. I've got a new back-in-the-day story for you, which I think you're really going to enjoy. We're going to do some live Q&A just like last time. So speaking of which, if you are watching this on Twitch on the live stream right now, if you look at the chat, the moderators have set up a raffle, so you can put your question into the raffle to get it possibly answered tonight, okay? So what you need to do is use that command, get your question into the question raffle, and then in the, the last portion of this program, I will be answering Q&A questions out of that raffle. So definitely put your questions in, and uh, that's how you can do it. So <clears throat> the segments, the way it's going to work is, first I'm going to talk about myself, what I've been doing this week, the games I'm playing, what I think about those games, and everything about going on with my channels and everything on YouTube and, and on Twitch this week. That's going to be a first portion. And then we're going to talk about gaming news, which a lot has happened this week. Just today there were some really big announcements. So all that's going to be in segment one. Then we're going to have a break. In segment two, I'm going to come back and we're going to do my back in the day with DSP story. Today it's going to be a really interesting one about my gaming origins. How did I actually get into video games? What was my first exposure to video games? What were, you know, what were, what was some of the cool stuff about that? The stories, who, who was it that got me into it? What was my first console that I ever owned? You're going to learn all that today. So that's going to be the back in the day story. And then we're going to have another break. And then we're going to have a final segment where I do Q&A with, live with the fans here on the stream. So... <clears throat> I'm not sure how long the show is going to run. Last uh, last time it was two hours. I'm hoping to go a little bit under that. I mean, that's a lot of time to talk. Speaking of which, I do want to preface the podcast with this. I do have bad allergies right now. I am a little bit under the weather when it comes to my sinuses and my throat. So if I sound a little hoarse, if you hear me snorting or <clears throat> clearing my throat during the podcast, that's why I'm doing it, and I apologize. It's a really bad year this year for allergies. There's pollen everywhere in Connecticut. Uh, because we actually had a longer spring than we usually do, and therefore I am being, being negatively affected by it. I apologize for that, but I'm going to do my best to get through it, just like I've done with all my quality content this week, okay? Okay, speaking of which, this week, let's get started. So this week has been a very unique week. A week that I started out, I thought was only going to be maybe one or two games that I was playing, and it turns out that all this other stuff ended up coming out almost like almost unannounced. I didn't know it was coming out. Surprisingly, ends up being some of the best content of the week. So let's run down. First of all, this week was unique because on Sunday, I got exclusive access to Marvel Heroes, which is a new free-to-play MMO game uh, that came out publicly for everyone on this Tuesday. But I actually got a two-day advance screening, basically, of the game because I paid... For a premium content pack okay now i played the hell out of it that whole day i had a marathon stream going and basically what i've discerned about the game the game is diablo with marvel characters it literally like it's just as addictive as the original diablo and diablo 2 loot system very similar there's a crafting system in there that's very interesting you constantly get new powers and you're leveling up and the game is really good in that regard However, what I'm finding and what I'm getting as feedback from my viewers is actually that it's not a kind of game that you are going to enjoy watching that much. 
And what I mean is, is there a story? Yes, but that's kind of like backseat to what the game really is, which is just click, 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 click. Oh, hotkeys. Hotkeys, click, 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 click. That's how you play the game. And that was just like the original Diablo. Extremely addictive, very simplistic gameplay, but a formula that worked. I think that's going to work for this game, especially because it is free to play. As of Tuesday, the game is public. Anyone can download it. Anyone can play the game. So it's really neat in that regard. Um, but people are basically telling me, Phil, you know, you played it for two days, and we were so tired of watching it on stream and even on YouTube, barely the videos. Some of the videos that I uploaded, like, on Monday or Tuesday, I think it was, still don't have a 1,000 views. So people are basically telling me we don't want to see any more of that right now. So I've got a plan for that. And I think you're going to like what my plan is, so stay tuned because I'm going to talk about it in just a few minutes what the plan is for Marvel Heroes, okay? Then on Tuesday, there was supposed to be a new release, Remember Me, which is a retail game published by Capcom but made by this, uh, this studio called Don't Nod. And I guess this game has had like a story history of development where it's been through, through other development studios. It finally landed with Capcom as a publisher, and uh, it's interesting. Let me put it this way. The graphical design... The art design and the story of the game are extremely interesting. The gameplay, eh, not so much. A lot of the gameplay is kind of combat that's repetitive. Now, there is some variety to it, and I am getting even more into the variety, unlocking stuff over the course of the game. But really, the core is platforming. It's very basic platforming that you've probably done in Uncharted and Assassin's Creed and a hundred other games recently. So it's probably nothing unique in that regard. The game's not bad. The game's actually still pretty good. It's just, I don't know, it feels like, I don't know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it has its own identity, let's put it that way. The story does, I feel like I could watch a movie of this game, but I don't know so far if the gameplay is really living up to that. Um, but people are liking, people are liking the streams, people are, you know, on YouTube, the playthrough's doing pretty decent, so thank you for that, and I'm going to continue that game, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, no one knew this was coming out, Scorpion was released, for Injustice as a DLC character, and he was released only for season pack holders. If you didn't buy him in the season pack, you had to wait an extra week, but no one knew this was going to happen, and so it was kind of a surprise. I did a surprise second stream with Scorpion. We went in the lab with him, we did his arcade mode, and then we jumped online and did some online gameplay with him. So, personally, I don't like the character. Personally, number one, I think he's out of place. I don't think he belongs in Mortal Kombat. In Mortal Kombat, he, don't, he doesn't belong in Injustice. He does belong in Mortal Kombat. Number two, Compared to other characters, he seems pretty weak. Like, it seems like you really need to put in some effort to try to, to use the mix-ups and stuff to land damage with him versus some other characters. I got one hit, here comes a 40% combo. With Scorpion, it's more like, I gotta mix him up. I gotta try to do a tricky cross-up so that I can then do a combo. And he, he relies more on, like, limited setups or mix-ups of high-low that don't really turn into huge damage combos. I could be completely wrong, but playing him for one day... That was my impression. I was not pleased with Scorpion, but that footage is live on YouTube, and there's actually eight more matches that are the last eight matches that I'll be uploading tomorrow. Um, so then, all of a sudden on Wednesday, another game comes out that I had no idea was coming out. It's called State of Decay. It's a basically an open-world zombie survival horror game. I want you to picture it like this. Imagine Grand Theft Auto with zombies. Like, in the zombie apocalypse. That's pretty much what State of Decay is. Only it has unique strategy simulation elements mixed in. Because if you die once, you die permanently. So you have to find other survivors. You have to recruit them and do things for them. And gather resources so that they survive. And then you can eventually play as them. And you, they each have unique traits and things that you unlock. You look for guns. You're looking for food. You're looking for ammo. You're looking for all kinds of stuff. You have the ability to move your base around. There's... Lots of interesting story-based missions. And interestingly enough, you can fail the story-based missions, which I didn't know until today when I failed a critical mission for not doing it quickly enough and someone in my camp who was sick died because of it. I was like, whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen. So really freaking interesting the way that this game works. The thing that gets me the most, it's an indie game on Xbox Live Arcade. And people, I was playing the game and people were looking at it in the playthrough and they're like, is this... This is a retail game. Where can I get it? Where can I buy it? I gotta go to the store right now. Like, you don't need to go to the store. If you have an Xbox, it's on Xbox Live. That's the only way you can get it right now. I don't know if they've announced that they're gonna try to make it for other consoles or PC, but the game is really fucking good. So if you have not seen any of the streams or checked out the playthrough yet, I urge that you do. 
and the gameplay is only going to get better over the next several times that I play it, I get the feeling, because the game's really actually starting to pick up. So I'm really pleased with that, and I can't wait to play the game again. The one thing this week that I have not had a chance to do yet is play Grid 2. And this was a racing game that I was playing last week alongside the other new release, uh, and I, I like the game a lot. Don't get me wrong, I do like Grid 2 a lot. It's just that it's a racing game, and I haven't had time because there's all these new releases that I'm playing and I'm spending my time on. So... The way that it's going to work is this. Let me give you an idea now of the schedule and what to expect in the next few days, okay? Basically, tomorrow, I am going to be doing one live stream only of gameplay that's that's a current playthrough, meaning I'm going to be doing Remember Me as my first stream in the afternoon, and I don't know how far I am into the game, but I need to get a chunk of gameplay done because obviously I need to start going on these games and see if I can get near the end of them. And then my second stream tomorrow night is going to be Demon Souls. So for those of you who have been waiting, you know, weekly I play Demon Souls. Friday is the day this week, Demon Souls, Friday night, okay? Saturday, I'm going to be doing a combination. I'm probably going to be doing a stream of State of Decay during the day. And my second stream will probably be Remember Me if I haven't beaten it tomorrow, which I don't think I will. If I did beat it, I'll start Grid 2 again, okay? Um... So that's the schedule for the next two days, just so everybody knows. Now, huge change this week. Huge thing. We've never done this before. Doing it for the first time. Trying to see if we can make it happen. We are going to be doing stuff with John Rambo, but he's not going to be in-house. And let me explain what I mean. John actually texted me today and he said, Well, Phil, when we do our co-op this week... Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, well, we could do some more SGC training, but technically we've done that for two weeks now. Maybe we take a break from that for a week. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't really know what other games. Like, we've been playing Battle Block Theater, but I think the momentum on that has kind of died. I'm not sure. And he says, well, why don't we play Marvel Heroes? Uh, he really likes Marvel Heroes, by the way. He's been playing it. He hasn't had a chance to play it that much. He's basically played it exactly as much as me this week. But for what he's played, he's really liked the game. So... I said, okay, we can do that, but how can we logistically make it happen? Because it's a PC game. It's not something we can sit here and play two-player co-op on one TV. So we're thinking about it, and I belch, and we're thinking about it, and we're like, well, first of all, logistically, could John get his PC here, physically? And John said, you know what, Phil? I don't want to chance it. I don't want to chance unhooking it, bringing it in the car or whatever. We hook it up, and something happens. I said, okay, I perfectly understand that. I've had more than my share of computer problems over stupid shit. I don't want to risk him damaging his computer, especially because he only has the one, and if something goes wrong, now he can't do the show, now he can't work on Schnozman a whole bunch. It would be a fucking disaster. So I told him, all right, don't worry about that. So let's look and think of other options. I said, well, could, could he play from my PC in the other room? I thought about it. I said, no, he couldn't, because that's on wireless internet, and to have me playing on a wired internet and streaming on wired internet and then him trying to play on wireless internet, I guarantee you it's not going to work. It's going to be too flaky. So that was out. And there's no way, I don't have a long enough cable to run into that room to actually have him play over there, okay? So then he said, all right, what about the laptop? The laptop right now that I have in front of me for streaming, okay, that I use for streaming and other stuff, could that run the game? And I looked at it I said, it could probably run the game. It does have an NVIDIA Optimus whatever the fuck they call it now, graphics card inside of it, and it is a, a, a Intel Core i7, a pretty good fast processor, and it has 8 gigs of RAM. But, I don't know. I don't know how realistically it's going to work, um, and if it would work properly. I haven't installed the game on there, I haven't tried it, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, I don't know, realistically, if I could get it to work on the laptop... And then I thought to myself, do I even want to install a game on here? Because this is a laptop that I need on a daily basis. I have to have this functioning in order to do live streaming. I said, do I really want to fuck around installing shit on it now? And I said to myself, you know what? I'm probably not. I, let's not take the chance. And then finally we came to the conclusion, the only way we're going to make this happen is to play it over the internet, not in person. For PC games, it's just not viable right now to be doing co-op in person like that. So... What we decided to do is we are on Sunday going to be doing a marathon stream of us uh, live streaming Marvel Heroes continuing on. So John Rambo is apparently only like one, not even a full mission ahead of me in the game. 
So we're going to be picking up from where my playthrough left off. And so my playthrough of Marvel Heroes is going to become co-op halfway through, which is pretty neat. And from what I'm hearing, John has a few people who've been playing the game that he's going to invite. And we're going to have a big party. And we're going to try to take on the rest of the game together, which could be really awesome. Okay? Uh, we're going to be talking over Skype. So unlike the previous videos of Marvel Heroes that I've done, I will be talking over Skype. Uh, and we'll hear their voices over Skype. So we'll have some audio communication. My, my Actually, my Turtle Beach headset has the capability just by pl plugging it into USB to do headset, microphone, plus, you know, surround sound all in one, which is really neat. So that's what I'm going to be using, and then we're going to be doing that on Sunday. But you might say to yourself, but wait a minute, Phil. What about Smart Guys? Because that's your wrestling commentary show. You do it every week. And actually, we are very close to our 100th episode, which we may have something special planned for everybody, okay? Um... But that being said, what are we going to do regarding Smart Guys? And the answer is, we are going to live stream it over Skype. Similar to how John Rambo does his show, where he has himself in a window, and he's got OJ in a window from Skype, and that's how they do it. That's how we're going to do Smart Guys this week. So it's an exception. This is kind of like a demo of, I mean, we, I've been talking about this for a while. There may be a time when I move. And if I move, we still have to have capability to do these shows. So this will be a cool way to test it out and see... If there's a, a week when there's no chance that we can be together to, for, to do it, can we do it over the internet like that? So we're going to be attempting live streaming Smart Guys here on Twitch and then recording it and uploading it to the King of Hate Vlogs with the two cams from us both being at home, okay? So I know some people may be disappointed. They like the classic style. I, I agree, but this week is an exception. This is by no means going to be the norm, just so everybody knows. All right, so that's going to be... Sunday, And that's cool, too, because I've never done the Skype thing, and I'm going to be doing it for the first time. So maybe I'll learn the ropes of how to do Skype in a podcast, and then for future podcasts of here, I can have guests and stuff. Because right now I have no clue how to fucking do it, okay? All right, so that's the, the plan for Sunday. And then Monday is the beginning of E3 week. And this week is going to be huge for a number of reasons. Number one, E3 this year is probably going to be one of the most important E3s in the past six to seven years and the reason i say that is you're going to have the unveiling and the public display and hopefully demo of both the playstation 4 and the xbox one and we're going to see them head to head we're going to see what these guys can do in their press conferences to bowl us over because i think there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of questions and things left over from the initial announcement press conferences that a lot of people are looking for answers to e3 is going to be that time okay so let's see what happens. There's going to be a huge E3 for that because of that. We're going to get to see all the launch titles for these consoles. We're going to get to see what's in the works for these consoles. And it's going to be a huge freaking year. That being said, what I'm going to do is cover E3. What I mean, which I mean I'm probably going to do one once a day. Maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, even Thursday. I'm probably going to be doing a podcast slash vlog video where I talk about my honest feelings about what came out that day regarding E3. Um, and I'm going to have it both here on Twitch and also going to upload it to my King of Hate Vlogs channel. Uh, or, what I'm even thinking of, I may even just upload it to DSP Gaming so that way it gets even more exposure. Now, I do want to disclose something ahead of time because undoubtedly people are going to catch on to it. There is a program going on right now with Machinima Partners that we get an incentive to do E3 coverage videos. We actually get a, a, a boost in payment for views on those videos. So I want to fully disclose ahead of time, way before probably anyone else is even talking about it, that I am going to be doing E3 coverage, and I was going to be doing it anyway, because if you actually take a look at the videos that I've done about the Xbox One and stuff like that, those are have the hugest views on them. So there's no reason for me not to cover E3 fully every day and be the source of information and also discussion for these things every day on a daily basis. But I do want to let everyone know, yeah, I am getting a little bit extra, something extra out of it. I'm not trying to be sneaky and I'm not only covering E3 because I'm getting something out of it. Last year I was at E3. Unfortunately this year there was no opportunity to attend, but I'm going to be doing my best coverage available from home and hopefully it goes well, okay? So that's going to be all next week. And of course then we're leading into The Last of Us coming out later next week. We'll talk about that next week. When I actually do the podcast and that kind of stuff, uh, we'll talk a little bit about leading into the, the Last of Us. Right now, I don't even know, like, I don't know the details. I don't even know if GameStop's doing a midnight release for it. I was actually told that typically in the summer they don't do midnight releases. So I don't know what's going to happen with that, but I'll have more info for you next week. Okay? So that's the schedule for this week. Jam-packed with content. Uh, new games. All kinds of fun stuff going on. I'm excited. 
And uh, I cannot wait to, to continue this week. It's been a good week so far for gaming anyway, for gameplay and gaming. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we've covered all that, let's very briefly... Well, not briefly, but let's talk about gaming news this week. And then we're going to talk about SGC coming up. In fact, you know what? Let's just talk about SGC now and get it out of the way. I'm going to be mentioning this in every vlog video that I do and every stream that I do. But SGC is Screwtack Gaming Convention. It's a convention being held in Dallas from June 21st through 23rd of 2013. It's a convention that myself, uh, my girlfriend Panda Lee, John Rambo, OJ, OJ's girlfriend Carol Ann are all going to be attending. We are guests. We have a panel at this event. And uh, it's going to be a blast. It's by gamers for gamers. It's run by gamers. It's not one of these big corporate events like E3 where all this is booths and publishers trying to shove tripe down your throat about their games. No, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a game room with arcade games, a game room with all kinds of console games. There's going to be all kinds of competitive gaming going on. There's going to be a vendor area with hundreds of vendors like are lined up for this thing at this point, which is crazy. Uh, there's going to be panels outside of mine. There's going to be other panels, live events, concerts. The Iron Man of Gaming is going to be going on, which is a competition that I'm participating in and I've practiced for for the past two weeks. You can check out those training videos on my <clears throat> gaming channel, DSP Gaming, if you haven't seen them yet. They're freaking hilarious. They're with myself and John, basically effing up every 10 seconds, <clears throat> trying to play these classic games, and it's pretty funny, so definitely check those out. <clears throat> but anyway, ScrewTech Gaming Convention is going to be a blast. And we want as many people as possible to come out and hang out with us. So <clears throat> sgconvention.com is the website if you want to check out details. However, I do want to warn you, you need to register soon because the pre-registration, from what I'm to understand, is closing like shortly. So if you don't register like really soon, you're going to have to pay more money if you just go and show up at the door and try to buy a ticket at the door. Now, if you do pre-register... There is a link that you can use that's a referral link for me that gives us credit and basically lets them know that we got people to come attend their event. And if we're a big enough draw, chances are they'll invite us back next year. So I'd appreciate it if you use that referral link if you do register for SGC. It was just po pasted in the stream chat right now. And I'll also be sure that when I upload this video to YouTube that I put it in the description of the video so that you know to use that link. Okay? So that's it for SGC. I just want to give the promo spiel again and we'll be talking more about that as we approach it. It's only in a couple weeks now, so we're getting pretty close. Two weeks. Okay. So, now let's talk about gaming news, and then we will adjourn for a short break. Uh, gaming news this week. First of all, it just came out. Ed Boon, I guess, tweeted or said somewhere who that there will be more DLC characters in addition to the, the season pass that's purchasable now for Injustice, and it's unclear whether or not they're going to offer a second season pass and say this is season two, uh, you know, DLC characters, or they're only going to sell them separately. It's very unclear. Also, people are wondering what's going to happen because there were lots of strong rumors that General Zod was going to be the final DLC character for season one, but if anyone saw the teaser trailer for Scorpion earlier this week, this teased at the end, Martian Manhunter kind of jumps out of the background and it's teased that maybe he's going to be the next playable character. And if that's the case, then what happened with General Zod? Was that just an overblown rumor? Will they be pushing him to Season 2? What's the deal? So I think a lot of people are interested to hear the announcement, and we're all assuming that's going to be announced next week at E3. Um, I personally, I, I'm, it's cool that they're making more characters, but to, for my question is, well, wait a minute. I paid 1,600 Microsoft points or whatever the hell it was, I don't remember, for a season pass... And I assumed that was going to include all the DLC characters. What I ended up getting was two DLC characters, then a character from Mortal Kombat that I didn't want. I don't know who the fourth character is going to be, but now you're already telling me I have to pay more money to get more characters. Like I, I am a little deflated there. When someone tells me, here's the DLC pass, season pass, I'm assuming that's going to cover all the DLC for the game. Not we're going to sell several passes, depending on how each one does. So in that case, I am a little upset about that, but... Being that I've had so much fun playing the game, being that every time a new DLC character comes out, I've tried them out, I've had success, you know, playing with them, doing little mini tutorials and going online and playing, I'm probably going to continue getting the characters. I'm not 100% on that. I guess I want to see who they are first, but I guess we'll see that as it goes along. <clears throat> um, there are strong rumors uh, that there's actually going to be Mirror's Edge 2. Uh, there was a leak, I guess, at some point. I don't know if it was a, a retailer or if it was something, but someone listed... Mirror's Edge 2 as one of the games that's coming out for PlayStation 4, to which everyone said, we didn't even know the game was like being made. We've heard rumors, but we weren't even sure. 
So everyone's looking forward to next week at E3 to hear if there really is concrete news. Is Mirror's Edge 2 coming out? Because I'll be honest, the game was a great game. It was buggy, but it was a great game for what it was. It was completely unique. The visual appeal of the game was outstanding. One of the big, most creative and artistic games I've seen that I've ever played. And it's been quite a while since the game came out. And this may be a game that could push the graphical limits of the PlayStation for two new heights. So everyone's excited to hear if that game will be coming out next week. Um, some new news from today. We got word uh, that Metal Gear Solid 5 is actually now going to actually take place over the span of 24 hours. And it's up to Snake to stop some crazy-ass terrorist, and only Snake can do it. And there's actually going to be all drama with a countdown coming and everything for every hour. And it's going to be 24 hours of real time. That's pretty crazy, and I'm full of shit. I totally made that up. But the reason that I'm making that joke is because it was announced that Keith or Sutherland is going to be the voice of Snake in Metal Gear Solid V. So all the, the, the hoopla and the... the, 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 the controversy on the internet about David Hayter not being the voice actor for Snake is absolutely correct. They actually went uh, to a celebrity to get the voice for Snake in the next game, which is kind of interesting. I mean, Kojima has never done that before, so why he's seeking... Maybe he's a fan of Keith or Sutherland? I don't know, but uh, all I have to say is thank God that Metal Gear Solid 5 actually isn't 24 real-time hours of, of uh, you know, content, because what it would end up being is two hours of actual gameplay and 22 hours of overblown cutscenes. <laughs> so instead of seeing the 22 hours of, uh, of a, a TV show, which is basically what it would be, hopefully we'll get some more gameplay out of the game, and we'll have to see what happens, what Kojima does with Metal Gear Solid 5, hopefully later this year. I don't know if it really is going to come out this year, but I guess we'll see. Okay, and last but certainly not least in gaming news, even though it's no surprise to anyone and everyone kind of already accepted this, uh, it was solidified today actually in an official post by Microsoft on their forums. It was reposted re by Major Nelson. More information regarding the Xbox One because all this, these questions and this controversy happened after the press conference that they held two weeks ago was the reveal, the big reveal press conference for Xbox One. But they only talked about weird capabilities that gamers don't care about. Like, it's a TV. It can, it can run your cable and you can have, fucking do Skype on it. Everyone's like, I don't give a shit. What about the games? And then all of a sudden, after the, the announcement press conference ended, all these rumors started floating around and people who were being interviewed were, were kind of confirming these rumors, these Microsoft reps. About, oh, can you play used games on it? No, you really can't. Can you trade in the games? No, you probably can't. Does it always need an internet connection? Yeah, probably does. Does it always need to connect connected? Yeah, probably does. Well, Microsoft officially came out with a statement today confirming pretty much 100% of the negative things that people have been talking about the Xbox One in the past few weeks. So which leaves me scratching my head saying, so let me get this straight. Microsoft actually had the opportunity to make a preemptive move. They heard the huge lashback that they got from fans, from gamers, from everyone when they heard that all these things were going to be on the Xbox One. And they could have said, all right, listen, we got this big backlash that hit us in the face. We weren't expecting this negativity. We got to change some of these things because this thing's never going to sell unless they, we fix it. Two and a half weeks later, no, they just confirm all the negative things. So next week at E3, unless the Xbox One it has like the best lineup of games ever seen to man, I don't think the Xbox One is going to sell at all. I think that people are going to say, fuck, fuck Microsoft for being so cocky, but just because they were the market leader for a long period of time during this generation of consoles doesn't give them to write to make it basically an anti-gamer console, which is what it's looking like the Xbox One is going to be. So to give you an idea of some of the things that were announced... I had a good summary from NeoGAF, a uh, posting here. Uh, highlights of their announcement from today. Uh, there's no renting, no loaning, and no private sales of games. And what they mean by that is that each game is tied to your Xbox Live account. The only way that you can give a game away or give it over is if someone has been on your friends list for 30 days and then they play the game on their console, it gets locked to their console. What? So, really weird, and it seems like there's no plan. Originally, Microsoft said, oh, we have a plan for the resale of games. Don't worry about it. Now, it almost seems there's no plan. It's not that there's an additional licensing fee or anything. You just can't do it. You're not going to be able to buy and sell 
used games anymore. It's just not going to happen. And everyone's like, huh? Like, what kind of strategy is that? Uh, the console must be connected to the internet once every 24 hours. If it is not, it will not function. So if your internet's out for a few days, you're fucked. Your Xbox One is a brick. And guess what? If you were planning on using your Xbox One as the cable box and everything, you're fucked because it won't work. So if you don't have internet, you don't have TV either. Wow, isn't that fucking great? What a great universal idea. No internet means no TV. Because if I'm without one source of entertainment and information, I definitely want to be shut off from the other. Wow, Microsoft is really fucking thinking here. Um, Trade-ins may be accepted at participating retailers who have deals struck with the publishers of the games. But if this copy and license protections is exactly what Microsoft is saying it is, I don't see how viability, how trade-ins could even work, again, unless there's some additional license that you pay. And if you do, it's rumored that it's going to be the full price of the game, in which case, why the fuck wouldn't you just buy the new game instead of the used copy of the game? Um, you can give a game to a friend only if that friend has been on your friends list for 30 days, and then once they boot the game and play it, it's stuck with them. So basically what they're saying is you will never be able to hand over games to friends. Trying to bring a... a uh, a game from one place to another will only work if you sign in on your account. You can't just give a game as a gift that you've already played and used. Uh, and then the la last thing is that supposedly if you're playing a game, now this is weird too, if you are playing a game on the Xbox and you're logged into Xbox Live, it checks once an hour to make sure that you're connected and if you're not, like if you start playing a game and then you unplug from Xbox Live, after an hour it'll stop letting you play the game. So again, to which I say, oh, that's good. So I'm playing Grand Theft Auto V by myself here, and all of a sudden my internet completely goes down, and the cable company announces, yeah, there's an outage in your area. After an hour, I can't play Grand Theft Auto V anymore. What? It, what if I'm playing it by myself? It's my fucking fault that my internet doesn't work? You know what I mean? Like, Microsoft seems to be living in some ridiculous futuristic utopia world where the internet is insanely blazingly fast which it's not for a lot of people where it's reliable which is where it's not for a lot of people and where it works 100 percent of the time where it's definitely not true for a lot of people microsoft has like their head up someone's ass this is not reality in reality the internet is a flaky thing People have it on and off all the time. Not everyone. I have one of the best connections in my area, and several times a year my internet still goes down, and I'm still unable to do my work. So outside of that, you're telling me now I couldn't even record the videos because I can't even play the fucking games if my internet doesn't work? What the fuck is Microsoft thinking? So my theory on this whole thing is this. As long as PlayStation at E3 does not come out, and say, oh, by the way, we're actually doing all the same stuff. We just didn't mention it in our press conference because we didn't want to cause any controversy until we were closer to the event. So unless they completely flub it and they decide to imp implement a lot of the stuff that Microsoft is saying too, I don't see the comparison between the two consoles. You are going to buy a PlayStation 4. Like, I'm just coming out and saying it. If you are the intelligent consumer, you will be buying the PlayStation 4. Unless you're such a fanboy that you need to fucking play the next Halo game, which, by the way, they're not even talking about because they're so fucking head up their ass about their stupid Halo TV series that no one gives a flaming fuck about. Why would you want an Xbox One at this point? I mean, I'm and I let's. I was the most staunch supporter of the Xbox 360 through this console's generation. I said that the Xbox 360 was the better console, not hardware-wise. Hardware-wise, it's a piece of shit that red rings like no tomorrow, but. For the usage, for the Xbox Live connectivity, for the ease of chat, for making parties with friends, for inviting people to games, for the interactivity of the dashboard and the way that that worked, the achievement system, which came out before the trophy system and is way more intelligible than the trophy system, everything about the Xbox 360 had the fucking advantage. Why would they throw that the fuck away? Why would you do that? We are the market leader for the majority of this console's lifespan. Now we've decided to completely change our business strategy, probably to make more money, even though it's going to completely backfire. I don't like, who do they think the, the customer is? A complete fucking brain dead idiot? Well, besides for the rabid fanboys who fucking play Halo nonstop and that's all they play, I realistically don't see anyone going for the Xbox One. Why would you purchase the console? I mean, just be honest, if, if the PlayStation 4 does not have any of those negative features, why the fuck would you ever buy the Xbox One? 
And that's what I mean. E3 is a huge E3, the biggest E3 in the past seven years, I'm going to say it, because we need to see what these guys' real strategies are coming to these new consoles. Could Microsoft somehow do a recover? At this point, considering they just released all this information today, that's completely negative and stupid that they did that, I don't think they're going to recover. I think they're fucked. That's my honest opinion. Microsoft, I only have one thing to say to you. You blew it! Billy Madison knows what he's talking about. So, all right. So that's it for gaming news this week. Uh, we'll have more definitely. Next week's going to be insanely huge with E3 wrapping up on Thursday. I'm going to have so much to talk about. It's going to be a great podcast next week, so definitely tune in next week for that. Okay, so now it is time for a quick break. While I relax my voice, I'm actually going to get more drink. We're going to come back, and we're going to do my Back in the Day with DSP segment. You're really going to enjoy it. So please stick in there while we take our first break. I will be back shortly. Microsoft. Oh, I didn't even see it. There we go. <laughs> All right, everyone. So welcome back to the Hate Live podcast segment two. Uh, first of all, if you are still watching on live stream on Twitch, be sure to submit your questions for segment three, which is approaching very rapidly. Uh, use the raffle system in the chat to submit your questions, as I will be picking your questions via raffle to answer in the Q&A session in section three. Okay, so <clears throat> we are now going to do 
episode two of Back in the Day with DSP, where we reminisce about my gaming past, different things growing up, and so on and so forth. And today, I decided to go back to the roots, the very beginning, the actual spark that started it all, the thing that got me involved with video games from the very first shot. And a lot of people ask me, you know, Phil, how did you ever get into gaming? Are you a longtime fan of games, or did you just get into it because of competitive Street Fighter? And I think you're, the, the actual answer to the question is pretty interesting. Well, as of when I was a kid, I used to, every Sunday morning, walk to the local uh, news corner store, kind of convenience store deal with my father. It was called News Plus. It was right on uh, East Main Street of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And it was about two blocks away, two block walk. And we'd get up early every Sunday morning. We'd walk over there. And my dad would pick up the newspaper. Sometimes he'd get some milk or eggs or whatever we needed for that weekend. And uh, they would always have an arcade machine in there. And it was various things over the years. I played Ninja Gaiden. I played, uh, there was this thing, Pigskin, Pigskin Football or something like that. But it was a game where you actually played as violent Vikings who like punched each other and ripped each other's limbs off during a football game. Um, I played Katra. I played uh, several different games over the course of the years that we went there to get the newspaper. Oh, Paperboy. Paperboy was flipping huge at the time. That game, every, people were like, loved Paperboy. So I would play it every time I went there. But that was my only real exposure to video games. I didn't even know when I was a younger kid that there were like gaming consoles or anything like that. I hadn't been exposed to that. And actually, it's funny, because when I was coming of age to play video games, was actually the end of an era. There had previously been this era of arcade video games. We are talking about the real blip and bloopers, like Pac-Man and Galaga, and the things that used vector graphics that look like shit stencils today. But back then, they were really huge, and all of a sudden, it crashed. And when it crashed, it was because a lot of these games came to home consoles. And we're talking the Atari, the Commodore 64, the uh, Odyssey, those kind of, ColecoVision, had these versions of the games for the home, so people stopped going to arcades. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, there was this new launch of new consoles that came out, like the Nintendo and all that. I was completely out of the loop on all of that. I didn't know anything about that stuff. I was a, a kid that was always into, like, physical activity and or playing with, like, action figures. I had He-Man and G.I. Joe and Transformers. Those were the biggest things when I was a kid. Video games were, like, little, little down here, and toys and shit were still way the hell up here. Well, I remember one day I went over to visit my uncle, my uncle's house. We went there for a holiday or whatever. And he said, hey, Philip, come on into the, my, uh, my den here. I want to show you something. So I walk in, you know, I'm not knowing what the hell he's going to show me. And my parents, too, they're like, I wonder what they're going to show, what he's going to show. Them. And he boots up his computer. And on his computer, now this must have been an ancient computer. I can't imagine. But for the time, it was top of the line because my uncle was always, he worked for Xerox. So he was always into technology, computers, copy machines, printing, all that kind of stuff. So he loved having like the top of the line stuff. So he actually did have a really good computer for the time. Of course, we're talking mid to late 1980s, meaning the computer was probably shit by today's standards. But for back then, it was pretty damn good. And he boots it up and he shows me this game. Now, I don't remember, I think it might have, I can't remember put my finger on exactly what it was. I can tell you this, I know that he had one game that was more adult-oriented because there was a lot of blood and stuff, like it was guns, and my parents told him, don't show me that one. So I remember he showed me a game with like a plane, it was flying, and he was shooting stuff with a plane, and he showed me a few different games, I was intrigued because I had no clue what I was looking at. Like, I didn't know what the hell, an interactive thing that he's playing with. You know, with the, what is this keyboard and mouse? Because no one had a computer back then. So he goes, you know what? When you come visit, we'll, we'll play these games a little bit every once in a while. And then I remember after a few months, he said to me, Philip, I got a present for you. And he hands me this cardboard box. It was probably about, you know what? I could probably say it's about the size of this. About the size of an Xbox 360 box. He hands it to me. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, it's just brown, plain brown cardboard. I'm looking at it, I'm like, what is this? And I open it up, I flip it open, games, out the ass. I mean, we're talking, he had like 36 or 40 Atari games to cartridges in there, just ready to go. Some with instruction manuals too, which was a, re a neat bonus. And he goes, I got something else for you. And he comes out, and he hands me his Atari 7800 console. He says he doesn't want it got it he, he just doesn't want it for whatever reason and i was like 
wow, that is crazy. He's, he's giving me this cool video game console. So I went home and we hooked it up. And I played all the classics that, like, today they go down in history. Dig Dug, uh, Karateka, uh, Pole Position, um, Rampage. Uh, what else did I have? Oh, Ball Blazer, which was actually one of the very first games to use vector, not, or not vector graphics, but 3D style rendered graphics. It looked like crap by today's standards, but back then it was like, holy shit, it looks 3D. It's amazing. And in, in addition to all that, he actually gave me this thing, and I, I don't think I have any. Actually, yeah, I'd say the iPad is probably about the size of what this thing was. The difference is it was very thick. It's like this thick, a big gray pa plastic box with two knobs on top. I was like, what the hell is that? He says, just hook it up to your TV and you'll see. So I did. It was one of the very first home versions of Pong ever made. And I like, I had it. I, I don't know where it is. And this is kind of one of my biggest regrets is over the years of moving shit around and going through phases and stuff, I don't know where it is. I don't know where that, th that thing is probably worth thousands of dollars if it still works. But, so I had all this. And uh, I hooked up. The 7800, I played the hell out of it. I love the Atari 7800, okay? And it was it was classic what it would happen during the day. My dad actually worked the night shift, okay? So he would typically, he would uh, sleep a lot of the times during the day, wake up, and then go to work after dinner. And so what would end up happening was I would get home from school, and my dad would just be waking up, and we would go and play Atari for like 45 minutes before dinner was ready. We would eat dinner, and then my dad would take off uh, for work and we played so many games like for it was probably a, a year to a year and a half period where We just enjoyed so many classic Atari 7800 games And that's really my first mainstream exposure to video games But it was funny because when I was actually playing the Atari 7800 the Nintendo was already out Like you have to understand I was behind the times the reason my uncle gave me the system is because it was outdated He was probably getting the Nintendo and all that so I didn't have a Nintendo entertainment system at launch I didn't even know about it until years and years after it was out so I was busy playing the Atari 7800. And then one day, I remember when I was in grade school, one of my close friends, Eddie, he said to me, uh, you know, what games do you play, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, oh, yeah, I play, uh, you know, Karateka, and I play Ball Blazers. He's like, no, 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 what are you talking about? You know, what arcade games do you play? And I said, arcade games? What do you mean? He's like, don't you know the damn machines that stand up? I was like, oh, yeah, I used to play those in the corner store, uh, you know, when I go with my dad. And he's like, but you've never been to an arcade. And I was like, what the hell is an arcade? I don't, I don't even know. This is like a foreign term to me. I've never heard of it. He says, all right, here's what we're going to do. He says, this weekend, we're going to go out to Milford. Milford Mall, Milford, Connecticut. There's actually a mall uh, there. It's still there. Now it's called Westfield Shopping Town or whatever. Back then it was like the Milford Mall. So you're going to go to the mall. In the back, you may not even know it's there. In the back, there's a build. There's a, a not a building, but a, a store. It's an arcade. Meet me there at like 3 p.m. So we, so we did. My parents drove us there because we were young. So my parents drove us there. I walked in. I was like, oh, my God. Walking into a video game for the a video arcade for the first time, my jaw dropped. I was like, these games look way better than the Atari 7800. Because back then, games that were in video arcades always were a giant step ahead of what you could play at home. So I'm talking... Uh, you know, shooter games that they... I'm trying to remember what one they had because they did have one that I tried that first day. I didn't like it that much. I can't remember off the top of my head. But the game that stu stood out the most for me was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the arcade game, okay? I was a huge fan of the Ninja Turtles. I didn't even know this damn game existed. And when I walked up to it, first of all, it's four-player cooperative. You have to understand that. So how many games have you ever played four players with? Back then, that was unheard of. So for me, it was like, wow, this is like a blast, a four-player game. Of course, everyone was fighting to be their favorite turtle. Mine was Michelangelo. I don't think I got Michelangelo. I think I actually got Donatello, which I'm happy about because Donatello is the best character in the game because of his reach. So we played, played through the game, and I'm putting money into this machine. Now, originally, I think when we walked in there, my, my dad had given me like five bucks. He's like, here, go go have fun. So I'm plunking the quarters in. It's the first time I've ever played an arcade game, so I'm dying like crazy. I'm losing lives left and right. I'm wasting money like there's no tomorrow. I'm probably like an hour into it. I... I blew through my five bucks. I turned to my dad, and the countdown is on the screen. Now, this game, back then, you had to put the money in quickly, within like 30 seconds, or else you would lose your, your, your game. It wouldn't resume from where you were. I was like, Dad, I need money. And he's like, oh, well, you want to play some more? I was like, yeah, Dad, this is like the best thing I've ever done. It's so fun. So I was like, Dad, quick. So he runs. He grabs his gun. He runs to the change machine. Quick, gets the change, rushes over, grabs the quarter, get in just in time. 
Yes, so we get to continue. And luckily, some more people showed up to play, so we all kept playing. And finally, I remember, it was we've been here for over two hours. Eddie had actually left. My friend from school had played and said, all right, I had enough, I'm leaving. I was so enthralled, I didn't want to leave. And so I'm still playing this game. I got to Shredder, the last guy in the game, finally. And we're talking after grinding, like, Krang is the boss before Shredder. And if you don't know how to fight him, he's, like, insanely hard. I dropped, like, $4 trying to beat him. So finally, here we go. It's me and the Shredder, and people are playing, and all of a sudden Shredder's whooping our ass to the point where he beats everyone else. You know, they're all dead, and they don't have any more money, so the kid's left. And I'm playing him by myself, and I'm like, fuck. And he was blinking, too, so you could tell he was losing. He was, he was dying. And I turned to my dad and said, Dad. And my dad said, Son, I have no more money on me. We can't get any more money. I'm sorry. We're going to have to come back at a later date to beat this game. And I was like, no. I've been there for like two hours trying to beat this game. You get to the end, you're like, I can't beat the Shredder. This is bullshit. It was such a letdown. I was like, he had no money. Oh, man. So, so I know that was uh, uh, me digressing a lot, but what, uh, what ended up happening was that eventually, we did go to the arcade a few more times, but Milford was actually pretty far away from where we lived. It was like maybe 45 minute drive. So we actually found there was a local arcade that was called uh, Spanky's. And it was in our own city. We didn't even know about this. So we went there and that was kind of became my local arcade until that actually moved from that location to like one street over and renamed themselves Crazy 8 Arcade. And that was my hometown arcade for the majority of my life I'd say up until probably the year 2000 to 2001 when finally that arcade started to go on the decline and I started going elsewhere looking for competition. So that is how my consistent arcade gaming presence actually started. Now you may be saying to yourself, but wait a minute, that's kind of, that kind of, it doesn't explain the whole story because right now you're so into home video games. How is it that you... If you stopped playing your Atari 7800 and was going to co arcades to play games, where did consoles come into play? Where did you pick up on that? Well, that is a very good question. As I said, I was behind the times. I didn't have an NES. So I didn't know about Mario. I didn't know about Zelda. I didn't know about any of these classic games that today are like the, the hugest franchises there are. I knew nothing about them. So one day, I remember, my, we went to my godfather's house. And my godfather has three younger daughters. And my godfather's an engineer. He's been an engineer his whole life. He makes a ridiculous amount of money. He's, he's basically rich. I put it, say it that way. Um, and he has a really huge house. He has a big yard, pool, you know, all the nine yards. And he always seemed to get them, like, the technological stuff early. And they were, like, the early adopters because they always begged him for it. And he always gave in and spoiled them. So he got his daughters a Nintendo Entertainment System. And one day we were over there for some family get-together. It must have been someone's birthday or something going on. So we were all over there, and they were playing. I remember it was a hot summer day, hot. Because normally I wouldn't even pay attention to what the girls were doing. I'd be outside playing, but it was a hot fucking day. And no one was inside with the AC on because it was so damn hot outside. And so I walked into the living room, and they're, they're sitting there playing. And of all games to show me, of all things to give me, like, the bug that I need to play console video games, they're playing Super Mario Bros. 3. Now, if you want to talk about definitively one of the best games when you actually compare it to everything else in its era, like on a page, Super Mario Bros. 3 is probably one of the best games, if not the best game ever made. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, for people who lived in that era, that game was like the epitome of everything gamers wanted in a game. You had amazing graphics. You had a great soundtrack. You had engrossing, very well-controlled gameplay. You had a wide variety of gameplay. That was the game where they added in all these new power-ups and all these new Easter eggs, the flying, finding secrets, and all this kind of shit. The game was just, it blew my fucking mind when I saw it. I was like, why doesn't my Atari look like that? Like, my Atari doesn't have anything like that on it. And then they were like, yeah, your Atari's like, you know, completely two generations outdated, dummy. You're playing, you know, the last generation of stuff you need to get in the know. I was, after that, that was it. I was like, that's it. I got to get So I got the NES way late. It was kind of funny because when I got the NES, it came with Super Mario Brothers 1. And I remember when I bought it, I also got Super Mario Brothers 3. So I had part 1 and part 3 and didn't have part 2 
And then eventually later on, I got part two, and I loved it, but I was like, what the fuck is this? This isn't, isn't Super Mario. And then come to find out, Super Mario Brothers 2 isn't Super Mario. It's actually Doki Doki Panic, and they just put a skin over it in the United States and sold it as Super Mario 2 in the United States because they were afraid that American audiences wouldn't like the difficulty of the real Super Mario Brothers 2 that came out in Japan, which is a pretty funny story. So... After that, I had the gaming bug, but it's funny because I got the Nintendo system so late into its life cycle. I mean, we're talking Super Mario Bros. 3. That was the last Mario game on the Nintendo uh, Entertainment System. I only had it for about a year, and during that year, I played a lot of games. I mean, I remember playing Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, uh, Mega Man. Mega Mega Man was huge on the NES, I remember. It was so fun to play all the Mega Man games on the NES. I played two... Three and four, I actually played on the NES during its in the course of its lifespan, and I loved those fucking games. They were so good. Um, Contra, I had, um, and then I had some real fucking stinkers. Like I had this game called Abadox, which is the weirdest fucking shmup that I've ever played in my life. It's just a weird game. It's like disgusting, deformed body parts and things coming out of walls, and you're this little space dude floating shooting and it's hard as fuck too it's real hard if you don't have cheat codes that game is hard as hell and i remember one day i had a choice between i think it was mega man 4 and abadox and these two games i only had enough money for one i was looking at them i'm like i'm gonna get one which do i get i'm gonna get abadox and i beat the shit out of myself for the next month or two because i knew that i'd made the wrong choice finally when i got mega man 4 i was like i'm a fucking idiot why did i ever choose abadox and then it, it, it actually turns up that, like I said, it was near the end of the console's life cycle. So actually, a lot of the Nintendo classics, I never played the original. So for example, I never played The Legend of Zelda, nor the sequel. I never played them, because they were just games that got passed over, because I wasn't, I didn't, I got the console too late. Um, the, the big console for me that really solidified myself as a gamer was the Super Nintendo, because the Super Nintendo just had everything it had superior graphics and sound to the sega genesis which was really the only other competition at the time it was getting all the ports of the latest arcade hits including and i know that this is a different story that we'll talk about one day but street fighter 2 they were the console that exclusively got street fighter 2 first it was later that the genesis got it and the genesis version was actually far inferior to the super nintendo version so when you got the super nintendo you knew you had the best piece of technology you knew you had the first party titles that were outstanding plus all the third party developers were developing like crazy for the system like that was the heyday the golden era for nintendo and i'll be honest ever since the super nes nintendo has been going downhill they've just after that they were do the dominating force think about it, nintendo power was one of the top magazines in the country Everyone was Nintendo, 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 and it was actually at this time, this iconic end of the NES Super Nintendo era, that whenever you talked about video games, you wouldn't call them video games, you'd call them Nintendo games, because that was the thing, people knew it, Nintendo was the brand of video games. There were there were competitors, there was Sega, there was uh, the uh, TurboGrafx-16, there were other systems out there, but when you thought video games, you thought Nintendo, and that was the association you made when you were a kid growing up in this era. So the Super Nintendo really cinched it, and of course, you're talking classic games like Super Mario World, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, which is one of the best games ever made in, I'd say, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past and Super Mario Bros. 3, by far, if you look at that whole era of games, two of the most biggest masterpiece games ever, ever made. Um, Chrono Trigger, holy fuck. Final Fantasy 4 and 6, which really is, was uh, 2 and 3 in the United States, amazing games, like... And the, again, the jumps, leaps and bounds in graphics and sound, I, you, you were just, I couldn't stop playing video games at that point. Like, I was just <laughs> glued at home playing video games. The only thing that eventually changed that mentality for me was, I'd say, later on in life when I started, like, high school era. I had been playing games in arcades for quite some time at that point. Street Fighter was becoming a more competitive thing, and my friends were trying to urge me into competitive Street Fighter play. And that was about the time, high school era when I finally said I'm going to start traveling and doing tournaments for Street Fighter, and that's when I really fell off the whole thing of following up. That Dreamcast era was probably the time when I stopped playing a lot of games at home because I was only playing fighting games. When I played a video game, it would be Dirt Strike on the, on the Dreamcast or Marvel vs. Capcom 2 on the Dreamcast. That's what I would focus on 
And uh, that's a story for another time, a whole other time, because it's a whole other subject, and I've got plenty of stuff to talk about that as to when we get to it. <laughs> okay, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, segment of Back in the Day. I hope that it was interesting to you and it answered a lot of your questions about my gaming past. And uh, Next time I'll have another really interesting story for you. I've got, trust me, I've got hundreds of them and you're going to want to hear most of these. <laughs> Okay, so that's it for this segment. I am now going to take a short break. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to just fast forward to the next segment. If you're watching this on Twitch, please stick in there for a quick break, just a few minutes. We'll be back, and I'm going to do open Q&A with the stream chat. Uh, so everyone, this is your last chance. Please submit your questions via the raffle system in the stream chat. When I come back, I'll be randomly drawing questions, and we'll go from there. So thanks, everyone, uh, and I'll be back for the final segment of the podcast in just a few short minutes, so hang in there. And most importantly, you blew it! Don't blow it.
All right, welcome back to the third and final segment of Hate Live tonight. Uh, we are now going to be taking live questions from the raffle in the stream chat. But what I want to say, oh, I'm about to explode. Drink too much water. Uh, if the mods could please institute something so that I can actually see the questions, because what ended up happening last time was first we put it into sub subscriber only mode, but then no one could talk. And then we re-enabled it, but then I couldn't see the questions, and it ended up being a mess. So we can figure out something we can do here. Um, all right, so we did subscriber-only mode temporarily just so I could see some questions. I'll, I'll see a question, I'll answer it, and then we'll keep changing it back and forth, I guess. Um, all right, so now how do I do this? We do raffle, and what is it, pick? Uh, that didn't work. <clears throat> What's the command? It's raffle, pick. What is what is the command, guys? Because I don't remember what it is. Oh, here it is. It picked. I didn't see it. It's right there. Duh. All right, we got a question here. All right, user JetJackal1284 says, Nostalgia Critic made a video about our video game's art. I was wondering if you ever saw the video or agree with his views. I never saw the video. Um, I, like I said, uh, ever since I started here on YouTube a few years ago, unfortunately, I just I don't have time to follow anybody anymore. And I used to be an avid follower of the Nostalgia Critic, and I just don't anymore. Um, my view, and I've said this publicly before, I actually said this last week in the pot, or, or in the uh, King of Hate, uh, Ask the King, blah, is that I do feel that video games are art. I feel that they're a unique interactive form of art that should have its own kind of protections and legal protections when it comes to copyright and such because I don't feel that the existing laws are uh, updated enough to apply to it. I think they're very draconian and they only look at a, a black and white, unchangeable work like a movie or a TV show or a book. A video game, sure, there's code behind it and the code should be protected by law, but the actual experience you have with the video game, the gameplay that you add, your skill level, your inputs, that's what really creates the video game experience and the playthrough or let's play or whatever you want to call it. And that's a different experience than what those guys programmed into the game. They didn't copyright your experience with the game. They copyrighted the code. So I really feel that games are an interactive form of art. I feel that they should be held in a higher regard than they are right now. We had this whole discussion last week, so I'm not going to go too far into detail, but... A lot of people just still see video games as kiddie shit, which is why with these mobile games where you're playing, oh, I tap on the screen, Angry Birds, I play for two minutes and I put it away because it's just a kiddie game, it's a time killer. If people actually saw some of the masterpieces that have been out there, that the amazing plots that have been written, Heavy Rain, Bioshock Infinite, some of these games can blow your fucking mind and they hold up as well or better than ongoing TV series, book series, or even movies. So I think that really video games are the red-headed stepchild right now simply because they are an emerging form of entertainment. They have not been around for 100,000 years in this, this kind of a, of a format. Let's put it that way. Movies, pretty much since what? The 19... Uh, hell, I could say the 1940s, 50s, when they started adding, you know, color and everything to movies, they've been pretty much the same. You know what I mean? Now, yeah, they add 3D technology and everything in there, but it's the same thing. You're going to sit down for two hours, you're going to watch a movie. Video games have gone from bleeps and bloops and little pixelated pieces of thing on, on the screen to these amazing realistic representations of humans with these really emotional stories that grip you. It's a completely different animal. It really has evolved since, since the beginning. And it's been a, a quick ride. Like I was just talking about in my back in the day reminiscing. It was, what, the mid-19 to late 1980s? So you're talking, what, 20 to 25 years ago? So in 25 years, the medium has completely evolved to something completely different than it was originally. Movies and TV have not. They have not changed much at all. So I really do feel that video games are art. I do feel they need to be in higher regard. And I think that there needs to be better laws regarding them because the ones right now are too confusing and don't really apply to what the medium actually is. Okay. The next question was, Keith Sutherland is the new voice of Snake in the Metal Gear Solid game thoughts, but I've already talked about that and gave you my thoughts. The only thing I can say is this. Are people very disappointed that David Hayter is not the voice of Solid Snake? Absolutely. And I can understand that if you're a huge fan of the series. He's been along for the entire ride, and for them to just kick his ass to the curb like they did, I'd like to actually know what the thinking was, what happened 
that they decided to do this. But isn't it funny? Now, didn't I just get done saying that Kojima doesn't want to make video games. Kojima wants to make movies. Regardless of what he says with his fluff and bullshit, you can tell. Look at Metal Gear Solid 4. He wants to make a movie and or an ongoing dramatic TV series like uh, like 24. That's probably what he wants to do, ideally. Or at least he brings enough into the, of that into his video games. Well, isn't it funny he picks a well-known movie and TV, mostly TV actor, to voice a character in his new game. I mean, it's a, like a shoe and you know what I mean? So it's kind of like he's almost, over time, changing. If you look at the original Metal Gear Solid, then Metal Gear Solid 2, Metal Gear Solid 3, Metal Gear Solid 4, each one, a little bit less gameplay, a little bit reduction in the gameplay, more story, more cutscenes. Every one, it evolves, evolves, evolves. This one, I don't even know, like you may not even have to touch the controller. It may just play itself, and you just sit there and you listen to Keith Sutherland talk for 24 hours, and that's the game. I mean, it, that's really the direction he's going in. So, it, I can understand why some people would be disappointed at the fact that they're choosing Keith or Sutherland over David Hayter. Personally, for me, I'm not. I was never a huge fan of the series where I'm like, oh, that's the voice, and I'm so angry. So I'm not going to rage about it. But it is interesting to see Kojima, who's doing games that are very similar to ongoing dramatic TV series, pick actual dramatic TV actors to do the the, uh, the voice acting. So, okay. What do we got here? What was the next question? Did I skip one? No, I didn't. All right, so the next question here that was drawn, will I be going back to Skullgirls when the free DLC characters come out? Absolutely not. I mean, Skullgirls, don't get me wrong, it was a good game. I played it for a little bit. It was a little flash in the pan, and I was like, wow, that's cool, but I have no desire to play it. There never really was a competitive community around it. In fact, they just had it at some major tournament, and it had, like, a two entrants. And, uh... I mean, it's a shame because it's not that it's a bad game, but I have, I'm going to say this again because I keep saying this to people and they need to fucking get it through their heads. If you want to have a successful game in the United States of America, and I don't know about Japan, I don't know about Europe, I don't know about any of In the United States of America, if you want to have a successful game, stop putting fucking chibi anime-ish characters in it. You may be an otaku yourself and maybe you fucking cream over that stuff, the American mainstream audience does fucking not. This is why games like Guilty Gear, like Blast Blue, don't do that well in the United States compared to their foreign markets. This is not the market for that stuff. So if you really wanted to make a fighting game that was going to sell, you could have easily had realistic looking characters or anything else besides this anime chibi shit, and it probably would have done better. So I'm, I'm sorry, and like I said, I played Skullgirls, I actually liked the game, but even for me, I, uh, there's a limit to how much you can play until you're like, alright, enough, you know, the art style is stupid, it turns me off, I'd rather see something different, and I don't know why these people can't get it through their heads of all the things to make a game, Skullgirls, little miniature women with tiny titties and, and skulls and emo, and it looks like anime, and it's, what? What, fucking make a real game, you know what I mean? It was almost like a joke, like, instead of focusing on a real game, we're gonna fucking make this stupid thing, and then put real gameplay in it, and then say, well, it's a good game. Well, no, that's not how it works. It's about the artistic design, it's about the graphic design, the characters, everything being interesting, and that's not appealing to mainstream audiences. That's a little niche of your audience, the otakus that love that shit, it's not a giant group, so you made a game, basically, for the wrong audience, and that's really why I don't think Skullgirls is that popular. Or ever was that popular. Okay, next question. Let me make sure I didn't skip one. Because people are pulling them here. Alright. Uh, what would you be more afraid of? 100 spider-sized lions or one lion-sized spider? Uh, I'm probably going to say one lion-sized spider. Because chances are, if it were 100 spider-sized lions, I could run away from them. Or stomp them. I don't think I could do that to a giant spider. I think it would probably eat me and kill me or bite me and, and stick me and do nasty things to me. So I, that's my answer for that one. <laughs> All right, next question. We're going to pull one here. How do you do it? Raffle draw. Here we go. Can you burp the alphabet? No, I cannot. See, this is the thing. A lot of people, they burp by... Like, they do excessive air swallowing or whatever, and then they can, like, do it on command. And man, I just burp. I don't know if it's the way that I eat and drink. Maybe I, for whatever reason, I never learned to do it without imbibing so much air at the same time. But, no, I've never burped the alphabet, and I can't burp on command. I just burp. In fact, when I burp in my videos, it's because I'm not expecting it. It just happens. 
Um, the next question. Have you heard about the HD remake of Fable for the Xbox 360, and do you p plan to eventually play it? Um, well, it all depends. I mean, first of all, do people even want to see me play Fable 1? I mean, Fable, I'll be honest, Fable 3, after I played, a lot of people were like, this game sucks, don't, don't, we're not, you know, we're done with this series, they ran it into the ground. Now, Fable 1, I know nothing about. I never, I wasn't, you know, what was it, the Xbox One era? So I wasn't playing games like that at that time. Um... I would consider playing it if people had interest in it. That's what I mean. Am I going to play this game and people say, why are you playing that when you could be playing, you know, another new game or something else? It depends really on the timing of the release and uh, what else is out at the time and what, what people want to see me play. So. Uh, next question. Will you allow fans to join you on Marvel Heroes? Uh, it depends. What I would tell you is this. If they ever got the, the damn super groups working, I immediately would have everyone sign up. The problem is the super groups is the, the basically the clans or the guilds of the game. And as of you know when I played it the other day, they didn't work. It was empty. The menu was just go, gone. There's nothing there. So if they ever get that active and working, I'd be more than happy to have like a King of Hate guild or, or the, the Hate Ramborgia army or whatever. We'll have some big you know amalgamation of everyone together. And then whenever we sign on, we could probably see each other online and immediately start forming teams and team up. The problem is, again, I don't know. Um, now, this coming Sunday, as I said earlier in the podcast, John and I are going to attempt to be doing live streaming co-op of Marvel Heroes, and we're going to try to actually get other people in to play with us, so we'll see what happens with that. So Sunday, there is potential you may be able to play with us, okay? Next question is, Phil, do you think that Nintendo will show a good amount of games at E3? My honest answer to that is no. I think Nintendo will be probably showing Mario Kart, the, that Luigi version of uh, Super Mario Brothers U that really no one cares about. Uh, the probably Pikmin, which is the same game that they showed last year, probably will be the same demo too. Um, maybe they'll show uh, that HD remake of Wind Waker. Um, like I, this is this is stuff that they've already publicly announced is coming out. And there's like one or two other games I have no clue what the fuck they are that they recently announced on one of their Nintendo Direct broadcasts. And it's like, well, if I don't know what the game is, why would I care? So thanks for announcing that it's out. Why don't you give me some information about it so I can figure out if I like it or not. So if anything, maybe this E3, they'll be showcasing some new titles, not just the same old shit that you knew was coming, but maybe some new stuff. If that is the case, then I'm all for it. But if all they're going to do is show you the same shit, I don't even know why they're there. Like, just fucking stay home, play play with your ball at home, and uh, and, and do your little Nintendo Direct broadcasts that you think are, are so much better than going to E3 and actually presenting a press conference. And, uh, and do it that way, because, you know, it's going to be really embarrassing if they... Gigantic, huge PlayStation 4 display over here. Insanely large wall of Xbox Ones all running TV programs and no games over here. And then right in the middle is Little Nintendo with Wind Waker HD and Mario Kart. And the, oh, poor Little Nintendo. Remember when you used to be big, the biggest developer, and you made all the good games? And now you make a piece of shit console no one wanted, and now you get fucked? Fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright, what's the next question? Uh, let's see here. Uh, did you ever use the video game help hotlines, and did your parents ever confront you about the charges? Um, okay. That's a good question. Some people probably have no fucking idea what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I'm just laughing about the Nintendo thing. A lot of people probably still don't know about what I'm, what these video game hotlines were. So let me give you some perspective. When you used to buy a game, okay, and you opened up the, the, the case, there actually used to be this thing inside of the, the game's box or case, whatever it was, because originally we're talking old school games, it was boxes. It was called an instruction manual. And I know that a lot of you right now are saying, Phil, what is this manual that you speak of? I've never seen anything like it before, to which I say I don't blame you because most games today don't have it. I mean, just take a look at the pathetic excuse for a game. Remember me? Wow. I'm glad I fucking bought that at the retail store. Look at all that content. But anyway, yeah, they used to have these things, instruction manuals inside every game. And we're not talking little shitty instruction manuals. A lot of these things, they were thick, they were full color. The bottom line was, because there was no internet back then, 
What they needed to do was find a way to advertise the game. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, the way to do that was through the instruction manual. Because I think they knew that a lot of the times these games were going to rental stores and people would rent the game, get the instruction manual. Wow, this game looks good. Play it a little bit. Okay, I like it. And then go buy it. So it was really actually a part of the promotion to the game was the manual. But at the end of every instruction manual, or sometimes on the back cover, a lot of times there would be this number. And it would be like, for example, if it was a Tecmo game, it would say, call the Tecmo hint line. And it would be like one, you know, one nine hundred something, 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 something. Now, right now you might say, oh, one nine hundred, that sounds like a porn number. Well, that's kind of what it was. If you like you know how you could call a porn hotline right now, and a hot woman, which it really isn't, it's probably some hideous man beast, but sounds hot, over the phone will we'll talk you and let you get off your jimmies. Well, what you would do is you would call them and they would say, Oh, are you playing? Tecmo Super Bowl? Do you need some help with that, sir? <laughs> no, what would really happen, you would call, a lot of times it would be an automated menu, but you would call and you would, you would basically tell them what you're having problems with, and they had people who were supposed to be gaming counselors, who apparently were basically just people who played the game. But most of the time it was either an automated message, or it was actually a guy just reading from a manual like a manual uh, answers of how to answer questions that people asked about the games and they would answer your questions so you say what's the code for to, to skip the entire season to get to the super bowl and they would say that code is up down left right shove the controller straight up your ass because i just charged you 1995 for a two minute call have a good day sir and uh, that's literally what it would be like it would be like seven or eight dollars for the first minute 99 cents each additional minute and the thing is when you called it would like I said it would have an automated menu to start so you'd be already immediately you may have not even talked to anyone yet and you already paid like ten dollars and you're like fuck man what the fuck just to get a tip so later on obviously this went away because number one they realized that there was a market now for tips for people who needed help with games they couldn't figure stuff out or they wanted to know what the codes were and magazines such as Game Informer and Nintendo Power and then, of course, subsequently GamePro, EGM, they started to come out with full walkthroughs of games with all the codes for games. And they were just, okay, I can subscribe to this magazine for $20 a year, or I can pay $20 for one tip. Which one am I going to do? And after that, pfft, the whole market crashed. It, none of those hotlines existed anymore, and they all just completely dissipated. So kind of funny how when you get, again, you have a new emerging medium. Oh, wow, video games are becoming popular. Make get rich quick. Let's get people in a call center. Give them some stupid tips. Charge them fucking forty bucks a call to for you know a stupid code. Some dumb kid calls and then charge their parents fucking credit card up the ass. We got them. We got them. We got them. And then literally when the video game magazines became prominent overnight, all the the internet or I'm sorry, all the phone tip lines basically became obsolete. Kind of similarly to how when the internet became major and sites like GameFAQs started emerging. All the video game magazines basically became a moot point, and what they had to start doing was instead of being magazines that covered the gameplay of the games, they now had to cover previews of the games, review the games. They had to kind of change the format of what they were presenting at that time. Okay, next question. Oh, did I skip one? I can't see if I skipped one. No, okay, here we go. The next question. Uh, cards on the table. You're not one of the best gamers. Well, fuck you. On to the next question. No, I'm kidding. Um, since that is a fact, well, fuck you. On to the next question. All right, I'll actually answer the question. Uh, it could be funny to see you playing trash games like shitty simulators or something like that. If you're talking about surgeon simulation, whatever the next flash in the pan stupid free game is on the internet that... Toby Turner and PewDiePie and everyone's playing it, so everyone needs to play it to get cheap views. No, I'm never going to be doing that stuff. The exception to the rule was when I actually tried to play Slender, because everyone told me it was such an amazingly scary free-to-play game. I need to play it. I played it, and the game was fucking stupid. So that was, and that wasn't for me to try to craze out and do the same thing everyone else does with the scary sham. <gasps> oh my God! It's Slender Man. He's coming for me! Huh? No, I don't do that kind of thing. You know, I was just trying to show that the game wasn't scary, and that everyone who was doing that footage is just trying to basically exploit you for views by acting fake scared, which is really stupid. So no, I'm not going to be playing those stupid Happy Wheels nonsense. They can shove their Happy Wheels up their happy asses because I don't think that that's quality content whatsoever. It's just fucking stupid. All right. Um, next question. Will I ever play Awesome Knots? 
I actually almost did. I was very close to playing it with John Rambo as co-op one week, but then we ended up never doing it. Um, I doubt I'll ever go back to it again. Once these games get old, unless there's like a huge demand for me to do them, like uh, typically if I don't play it right away, it's not going to even get any attention. So in this case, no, I'm probably never going to play Awesome Knots. Next question. Any chance of replaying Red Dead Redemption or Heavy Rain? Um, hmm. Let me put it this way. First of all, I want to say that Heavy Rain still to this day is arguably my best playthrough ever. That's what everyone tells me. Now, I don't know. I think I've had some good ones. I thought Bioshock Infinite earlier this year, I thought that was like a triple-A fucking game and that my playthrough of it was pretty much triple-A. I know there were some parts where I got hung up and there were some annoying bugs where I raged a little bit. But for the most part, I loved the game and I really thought that would have been, you know, the Injustice campaign, the story mode from this year. I, again, that story was great. Since I was a fighting game player, I was able to get through most of the game without any trouble and focus mostly on the story. I really loved it. It seems like people really loved it on the stream. It's my biggest stream ever. 3,900 viewers at once were watching that. And uh, as, as well on YouTube, the views are humongous. So there have been some really recent playthroughs that I thought were very high quality. But people still, hands down, still seem to say that my Heavy Rain playthrough was my best playthrough of all time. So if you're asking me, do I want to replay it? My answer is this. I would actually like to replay the game and possibly play it differently and see how the different choices lead to different things happening in the game. But I, I dread going back to it for a couple reasons. Number one, I don't know if that first playthrough could ever be topped. I mean, that playthrough, like people say, if you think that's the best, chances are no matter what I do, you're going to say it doesn't live up to the, to the greatest playthrough of all time, okay? Number two, I have gone back to some games. For example, just recently, so many people were yelling at me and saying, why didn't I put Fallout 3 on my downtime games list or retro replay list because people want to see me play Fallout 3? So then I think this, the active decision, you know what, I'm just going to play Fallout 3. I'm just going to play it of my own volition over time and every once in a while you're going to see videos of it and no one i mean the streams do pretty good don't get me wrong when i do stream it the numbers are decent on youtube it really hasn't taken off and you know for a game that everyone's dying for requesting i put it out and i'm i think i'm enjoying the game i'm having a blast with the game i'm actually doing lots of the quest lines that i either failed or didn't do the first time around plus i'm doing going to do the dlcs plus i'm doing the optional quest that i skipped in my initial playthrough of the game. This is going to be a completionist playthrough when it comes down to it, except for, of course, for the few missions that you can't do because when you do one, it overrides the other, and that does happen somewhat in the game, but I don't know. People are just not like, you know, they're dying for it, and then I do it, and then they don't watch. So if that's the case, you know, what's my incentive to go back and really try to do, redo Heavy Rain as hard as I know that would be uh, to top the first one if everyone's going to say, okay, well, that's great, you did it. Well, we're not going to watch. So, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm sure there's many theories on why Fallout 3 isn't being watched. One guy was like, well, because you put out 50-something videos of it. I was like, yeah, but it was over a two-week span. It wasn't like I put out 50 videos in a day. It, I put out like 10 to 12 videos for several days. Then there was actually a week when I didn't even put out any videos. Now, this past week, I actually uploaded a couple batches. Today, I uploaded a couple. And I don't know. People just don't rush to those videos to watch them. Maybe they feel because it's an older game. There's no reason to rush. I can watch it at my leisure. But that's the bottom line is I don't want to rush back to a heavy rain playthrough if I don't think that I can top the first one and if I'm not sure that people are going to watch. Red Dead Redemption, I think I did it justice. I did pretty much almost all the content in the game. I played the expansion and the quality of the playthrough, although it wasn't direct capture, I think the video quality was pretty good. I don't see myself actually going back to play Red Dead Redemption anytime soon. The only exception would be maybe several years in the future. Maybe then I would go back. But right now, I think it's too soon to go back to that one. Okay? Okay. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, would you do that which isn't doable but could be done? But you could but you will not do in spite of you wanting to do it. If I could do the doable thing that might be done if it could be done but would be done, the question is would I do it? And the answer is All right, next question. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's pull another one. Most anticipated E3 game wish. My game wish. Jeez. Um, hmm. 
Alright. But I would really like to see, which will never happen. Like the, my game wishes will never happen, okay? What I would love to see is for them to take the classic Final Fantasy. So I'm talking Final Fantasy 4, 5, 6, 7. And remake them in HD with 3D graphics, with revamped, refined gameplay, and better soundtracks, voice acting this time around. I want to see those games remade, a real remake, because the problem is they keep remaking them, but they're they're like phony remakes. It's really annoying. Oh, we're going to re-release it for the fucking stupid uh, handheld system Game Boy Advance, and it's going to have two extra missions, but the same graphics and everything as the, the original port. Well, then that's not an improvement, and that's not even a legit re-release. I want you to redo the games and do them justice. How many years have people been asking for Final Fantasy VII to be redone? And they could do it, and it would be a huge fucking seller. But instead, Square Enix thinks that the, the, the current development staff think that they know better than everyone, and they keep making Final Fantasy games that no one fucking likes. So, I don't know what to tell them. That's one thing I would like to see. That'll never happen. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to see Killer Instinct come back. That's right. I'd like to see the series Killer Instinct come back and be made by the same dev team that worked on the originals, and it actually plays like Killer Instinct. Not that Killer Instinct comes back, and then it plays like Marvel 3, where you hit the guy once, and you do a 5 million hit combo, and the game's over. No, I want to see real gameplay in a fighting game for once. So, that would be cool to see a series like Killer Instinct come back, especially because a lot of people want it to come back, and it never did. Um, I told you, my wishes are crazy. My wishes are things that are never going to fucking happen. Um... <sighs> trying to think. Obviously, I would love to see Quantic Dream announce their next game. I know they're not going to, though, because they're, they still haven't released Beyond Two Souls, and that's a development studio that really takes their time to release games, but the games that they put out are fucking awesome. So, let them take their time for the next game is all I have to say about that, and let's all, you know, wait and be patient for Beyond Two Souls, which I'm sure is going to be a great fucking game later this year. Um, so, that's really pretty much, you know, pretty much kind of the things that, they're all dream, dream wishes, you know, it's not any realistic, because honestly, realistically, you kind of know what's going to happen to E3. You're going to have the next iteration of every fucking game on the planet. Here they come. Some of them will be for the next-gen console. Some of them will not. Uh, you're going to hear nothing that, that you're going to want to hear about the, the Xbox One. Instead, all they're going to do is be talking about nonsense. And then they're going to be questioned on all the stuff that people hate, and they're going to blow steam up everyone's asses instead of answering the questions. Uh, or they just won't ever even address those questions. Which is kind of funny, because I just got an email from GameStop, of all places. Oh, today, all the information on Xbox One was announced. Here it is. I'm like, why is GameStop advertising the Xbox One? This console potentially is saying, it's going to put GameStop out of business because no one's going to be doing used games anymore, and that's the primary chunk of GameStop's business. So why on earth are they even putting any, any kind of advertisement into the Xbox One? I have no idea. Um... Maybe they just think that it's it's better to have it and it's accessories and stuff and try to make money that way than just not have it at all or not talk about it at all. I don't know. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm not expecting... Uh, I am expecting it to be a huge E3 because we finally get to see the playing field leveled and we get to see who has what, whose stack is higher, and who really kind of wasn't talking about it because they really don't have a lot to show. So it's going to be an interesting year. I'm not sure exactly what I'm expecting out of it. So <clears throat> Okay. Let's see here. From an overall and big picture perspective, what direction do you believe the game industry is going? Do you think it will get better or worse? And what action do you feel needs to be taken to put it in the right direction? Well, here's the thing. This is what happens when the economy goes where it's gone, okay? When the economy starts to tank and everyone has less money, it stifles creativity. Because when you have a lot of money, let's be honest, you have so oh, I have a little bit of cash saved up, you're going to take more risk. You're going to say, wow, there's a game that looks kind of good. I haven't played it yet. So if I have a choice between Call of Duty every year, which I know exactly what it is and maybe I like it, versus this game where I don't know if I should give it a shot or not, you're going to go with the, the real dependable thing. Call of Duty, it's the same every year, but if you like that gameplay, you're going to keep buying it, okay? These studios, unfortunately, here's what's happening now. They're making these games, and people aren't buying them anymore because they're going for the same old, same old because they don't have money to spend on more games. And because of that, these games aren't selling well, and they're failing. And so you're asking me, what direction is the industry going in? Right now, the industry 
if anything, if you want to talk about growth, is in the mobile market because most mobile games are free to play until you actually want to do a microtransaction. So, for example, I have the Injustice app on the iPad. And the bottom line is it's a fully functional game that you can play for hours on end until you reach a certain point in the game and all your opponents become ridiculously hard. So either you could spend either more time grinding your characters up, grinding them up, grinding currency and money in the game to either buy better characters or level up your existing characters so much that you can progress in the game, but that's going to take a hell of a lot of time. Or, ooh, if I spend $5, I can buy that more powerful version of the Flash, and he'll dance circles around that opponent that I'm having problems with. And here you see the formula. Hook you with a free game that has interesting, fun, addictive gameplay, but only let you succeed to a point. And then make it, even though they may fool you into thinking, oh, if you spend enough time, you'll beat it. No one could spend that much time. Who's going to spend hundreds of hours on the Injustice app just to get you know to the end of the game? No, okay, I'm going to take the easy way out. Plunk that money in there. And that's how the mobile market is succeeding right now. It's little addictive games, not serious games with big overarching stories. Little addictive games that people only want to spend a few minutes playing, but once they do, they get hooked, and now all of a sudden they can't progress. They want to spend that extra money to get that to get to that next level, or to get that power up, or to get that avatar item unlocked so they look better. Okay. Now I want you to compare what I just said. The old gaming model, sixty dollars for a retail game that's risky. You don't know whether or not it's good, versus the mobile gaming model, a free game. You get it free. You know whether or not you like it up front. Then it's optional for you to plunk not $60, but maybe just a couple dollars into the pot, okay? $60, a few people buy it, versus free to play, a bajillion people download it, and some people sprinkle the money in. So, do you see the difference? And do you see why mobile gaming is so successful right now, especially in this economy? That's why. If we were 10 years ago, mobile games, no one would give a flaming fuck. People would be like, what the fuck is this stupid little thing? I want to play my serious game. But now things are changing. When you when you don't have money, things change. And that's really where things are going, the direction that things are going right now. It's even to the point where not only are the games not selling, but people just aren't even interested in them. So you have games that potentially could be really good games that don't sell and no one watches playthroughs, no one really cares about the game, no one even talks about it because they're all they're talking about is that major overhyped game. Right now it's The Last of Us. That's it. Everyone's getting The Last of Us. Everyone th knows Naughty Dog's great. And uh, they, they think that Naughty Dog's going to put out a good product. Of course, it's kind of cliche what the game is. It's a zombie survival horror again. So it's, you know, it's kind of along the lines of everything else, but it's the real deal. It's the sure shot. All I hear about right now is The Last of Us. Very few people are talking about Remember Me. Very few people are talking about State of Decay. Two games that are actually pretty damn good. State of Decay, I think, is exceptional for an indie game. A lot of people saw me playing it on stream and on YouTube, and they're like, what the hell is this? Because they hadn't heard it. All they were heard, Last of Us, Last of Us, Last of Us, Last of Us. And that's what happens when when it's like this. You only hear about the major publicized games because it's all that everyone talks about because it's all that everyone's going to buy because they only take the chance on the big ones. So, now that being said, I really feel that the, game, the gaming industry will change in time depending primarily on the economy. Because gaming, let's be honest, is a optional thing. It is a luxury thing. It's not something that you should have the, you know, it's not a, it's not a need. It's not something that you need to live. It's, it's something to kill time to have fun versus something that you need as a necessity. So when people have money to do it, they will. And you'll have, see these great overblown developed games with crazy, taking crazy risks and creativity everywhere. Or... You'll have what you have now, which is a hundred shitty mobile games that everyone's, you know, making money on, and uh, stagnation within the mainstream gaming sixty-dollar retail gaming community. So, all right, only one or two more questions I'm going to take here, and then we're going to wrap it up because we're about to about that time. We're getting up there. I don't want to go too much longer. So let's see, uh, let's see what the next question was. Uh, I don't see the next question. Uh, ah, oh, um, PewDiePie or Tobuscus, how about fuck them both? How about that? Or how about the two of them can move in together and have a nice gay relationship? <laughs> Alright, next question, please. 
Is Phoenix Wright ever returning? Yes, he is. In fact, there's a new game coming out later this year, supposedly. And uh, so all you Phoenix Wright fans will be able to enjoy the new game coming later this year. Okay, next question. <laughs> so I got to do Moobot Raffle Draw. Is that what it is? Oh, you both did it. Okay. <laughs> Phil, what are your views on LGBT rights? Is that... Does that stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transvestite? I don't know what that stands... Is that what that stands for? Can anyone answer? Because I have no idea. That's the only thing I'm, I'm guessing. Yes. Well, it depends on what you mean by rights. Like, uh, do I believe that, that uh, you know, two people who love each other and who want to spend the rest of their life each other should be able to have some kind of a union that's beneficial, similar to, or the same as marriage? I'm the kind of person that is of the mindset that far be it from me to tell you how to live your life. Far be it from me, of all people, <laughs> with the mistakes that I've made in my life, to be able to tell you... I know what's right 100% and I cannot be flawed because I know everything and I am the right belief and you are the wrong belief and so you must do what I tell you. I Whatever I believe is true and therefore I will impose my belief system on your life regardless of the fact that you probably have a completely different life experience than me which is why you don't have the views that I have but I don't care because I'm going to impose what I think is right on you and if you don't abide by it you're evil, you're going to hell, you're wrong, you should be persecuted, and, uh, you know, I am not one of those people. Far be it for me to ever say something like that. So for me to say, you know, any kind of a crazy thing, I could never, I could never do it. I feel that everyone has a right to happiness. Now, what is that happiness is obviously dependent upon the person. If there is a happiness that is, you're happy, but you just totally destroy the lives of other people, now that I don't believe in. But for two people who... You know, from all appearances or whatever, they say they love each other and they want to be with each other for the rest of their lives and they want to have the same kind of opportunity as, you know, men and women who do this together. I mean, far be it from me to deny that. Like, who the hell am I to say you can't get, get the same cool, amazing opportunities as everyone else? Because that's not an equal playing field and that's not fucking fair. And I, anyone who says that they know better or, oh, my belief is the correct belief... Those people are ignorant because they are not able to see from another person's perspective. They are not open-minded. They are not willing to accept change or things that are even different. And a lot of the times it's sad because the only reason that they think that way is because they were raised in a society or a culture where everyone always thought that way. And it's probably a lot of the times not even their fault. It's brain, literally brainwashing that these people grew up in this atmosphere and they think that they know better than everyone else and we have to just basically make it miserable for everyone who's not exactly the fucking same as us. So that's my... My, my opinion, I, I'm not going to go into specifics about certain things because we, now we're going to get into, into politics and me disagreeing with the politician. I don't ever want to get into that, that shit, sh that deep into the shit of it. Let's put it that way. But I think that everyone has a right to happiness and it's unfair that some certain groups of people think that they're more important than others. They know better than others and therefore you have to live by what they think is right or else you're a bad person. So I say don't be one of those people. Be open-minded, look, walk in other people's shoes, understand, see from their perspective, and then you will get further in life than other people. And especially all those people who are, just don't fucking get it, okay? Um, am I going to watch Man of Steel? The answer is very simple. Eventually, I probably will. Uh, eventually, I will probably see it on demand. I probably will not go to the movie theaters to see it. I've said this many, many times. Even and John Rambo kind of disagrees with me, but John, John basically told me uh, he goes to the movies for movies that he wants to see, and he doesn't have anyone to see them with. Uh, he goes during the day. He'll go like a matinee show earlier on in the day before you know the crowds get there, which I can understand. But even then, even going to the matinee show. A lot of the times you go to the movies, you got the fucking person on the cell phone. You got the fucking baby, wah, wah. This is a rated R movie, and you got a fucking baby, wah, wah. Mommy, I don't want to see this, wah. <laughs> and you just to the point where you're like, 
I got so... There was this one movie, I can't even remember what the fuck it was. But I was so turned off by the experience. The movie I was watching, I liked it. But I hated the experience of being in the theater. Then I came home, and eventually I bought this surround sound system. I've got a big HD TV. I think I would probably enjoy watching movies more at home than I do being in the theater, especially because unless you go to the super cheap matinee, you're going to pay 15 to $20 for a fucking movie theater ticket, which is retarded. If you're going to pay that much, why don't you get the fucking movie? You know what I mean? Or like, you, all right, I went to the movie theaters. I paid $20 for my ticket, but you give me a voucher so that when the movie comes out, I can get some money off or something. Not $20 to sit in a, a shitty movie theater with all these people making noise around me, eating the fucking snack. Nom, 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 nom. You smell the fucking shit. They're spilling their soda all over the floor. <laughs> It's not always like that, but I've had some really bad movie theater experiences, okay? So, uh, so that being said, no, I will not see Man of Steel in the theaters. I'll wait for it to be on demand, and I'll make my judgment then. Okay. One more question. One more question. Let's pull one more, everybody. Here we go. This is the last question. How do you feel with the modern industry's attitude? Remember me's mis- criticism, the law of... Uh, the Last of Us, no, that's not it. What's The Last of, oh yeah, it is The Last of Us. And others being judged as movies. The modern values that American games are also movies. Same with the, the fighting with devs. I don't really understand the question. Like they're saying, remember me's criticism. I don't know what the criticism is. I'm playing the game and I don't, I've stayed away. I haven't read any reviews. So I don't know what the criticism is of remember me to even address that. Um... <clears throat> I don't know about the, well, the Last of Us and others being judged as movies. Uh, I don't know. Like, can you judge a game as a movie? It's funny because you say we're saying the whole time now we're saying games are a work of art. We want games to be held in the same regard as movies. Yet then people complain that oh, you, you know, it's just a movie. You don't have enough gameplay or whatever in the game. You can't have it both ways. You know what I mean? But, like. You're either going to have a, a, a game that's very her- heavily narrative-driven, or you're going to have a game that's very heavily gameplay-driven. So here's a perfect example. Marvel Heroes. Free-to-play game, extremely heavy gameplay-driven. Primarily what the game is, is shooting the living fuck out of things around you, picking loot and money up off the ground, leveling your character stats up and unlocking abilities, going and crafting items which are better accentuating you know items for your characters, and then going back, wash, rinse, and repeat. Yes, there's a story. It's bare bones, and most people probably aren't even paying attention to it. Compare that to a game, I don't know, like Bioshock Infinite, which, yeah, it had, it had a lot of gameplay, but the story was outstanding. It was multifaceted. You had characters that were lifelike and realistic. It was primarily about an artistic presentation of a story with a crazy-ass twist ending that I don't think anyone saw coming at the end. And... That compared to a different game. Games are really different things. This is what I mean when I say that games are not the same as a movie. These works of art can be completely different depending on what's put into it, okay? So you got two completely different games. They are nowhere near close to the same thing. And even just playing through them, you're going to get completely different experiences. This one's extremely gameplay heavy, you know, time investment heavy. This one is more of a you go through it and you enjoy it. Yes, there are some challenges, but you're going to enjoy the ride and the story probably a lot more than the overall gameplay of the game. But both games are good. And that's really what I think may be missed here. You can't judge games based off of one criteria or one point of view. And this is what I hate about the mainstream reviewers. I don't like Resident Evil 6 because it's not like the old Resident Evil games. I give it a 4 out of 10. Well, wait a minute. Who's to say that the game itself is still good? It may be different than other games you've played. That doesn't mean the game isn't good. And that's to say, okay, well, The Last of Us, maybe it's more of a cinematic experience. But is it good? Did you enjoy it? Did you have fun? Was the story interesting? Did it make you think? Did it occupy you? Do you feel a sense of, like, wow, I'm really entertained by that and I'm glad that I played it versus... A game where you just sat there and grinding gameplay, grinding gameplay, grinding gameplay. It's different. They're different. You can't judge them the same way. You know what I mean? You have to see and judge and weigh and balance different factors with a formula. And you can't just subjectively out of nowhere say, well, I like a certain style of game, so fuck you. I don't like this game because it plays too much like a movie. Or the flip side of that, well, fuck you. This game is way too much repetitive, boring gameplay, and the story is glossed over. Because I see those reviews all the time, and it's like, well, 
One guy obviously likes gameplay more. One guy obviously likes the story more. So you can't trust any of their reviews because you know it will always be biased because of that. So I don't know if this is what you're getting at when you're talking about the mainstream media and all that. But that's my opinion is that games really need to be judged by themselves as works of art but also on their own merits. Was it entertaining? Uh, did it satisfy the need that you had when you were looking for a new game? Uh, were you just looking for gameplay? If that's the case, why did you pick a game that was primarily cinematic to play? So there's a lot of factors that go into this kind of thing. Um, again, I, don't, I can't address Remember Me because I don't know what the gaming media has said about Remember Me. So I apologize in that regard that I couldn't really fulfill the answer to the question uh, at the end there. So, Okay, everybody. Well, I want to thank everyone on the stream who submitted questions. I think we got some good ones uh, in tonight. I think that it was a pretty entertaining Q&A session right there. So this is going to be it, wrapping it up for this week's edition of Hate Live, the podcast that I'm doing now. And uh, we will be back next week uh, with a huge E3 wrap-up show. In fact, I'm almost willing to say that maybe next week, depending on how much E3 news we have to talk about, that maybe I'll... I'll cut out a certain part maybe it won't maybe we'll get rid of the back in the day next week or maybe we'll do a very abbreviated q a session because i get the feeling we're going to have so much to talk about e3 come thursday that we're going to really want to discuss things in depth okay so next thursday 8 30 p.m eastern standard time here on twitch or overnight i upload to my vlogs channel on uh youtube the king of hate vlogs so look for that coming up and next week we're going to have an episode i do want to remind everyone as the last thing to, as i go out here Next week is full E3 coverage. I'm going to be following all the news, watching the press conferences. I'm going to be basically trying to follow along with all the information regarding E3. And daily I'm going to be doing a, a podcast kind of stream where I'm going to be talking about everything that happened that day. And it's going to be here on Twitch live streaming. And I haven't decided yet if I should put it on DSP Gaming or the King of Hate Vlogs. I don't know where it would get more exposure. I obviously don't want to double dip and put it on both. But I need to figure out where would people want to see that more. I'm almost thinking DSP Gaming might be the right place for it. Even though it is a vlog style thing, it's something that a lot of people who are into my gaming content want to hear. So I don't know. Um, so that's going to be all next week. It's going to be great. And then, of course, late next week, we've got The Last of Us. So that will be cool to talk about right before in the podcast next week, right before actually playing the game. So that's it for Hate Live. Thank you for joining me. And uh, I hope that you will tune in for all the new gameplay and all the E3 vlogs and everything coming up over the next week. And, of course, to play you out, I will leave you with my final thoughts. Microsoft. You blew it! That pretty much sums it up. So thanks a lot, everyone, for watching Hate Live. I'll see you later this week. Peace out.